This week, I have two questions of my own. The first one has to do with Richard Trumka, who, of course, was the former president of the AFL-CIO, who unfortunately passed away last week. Um, lots of people called him the most powerful man in labor. Um, and, you know, I think this raises the question of, obviously raises the question of where the AFL-CIO is going to go next. Uh, and I want to mention that, you know, even before Trumka passed away, um, I believe that his term as president was expiring this year. So, you know, lots of people had been talking already about the future of the AFL-CIO um, even before last week. So my question for Labor Paul is, I think a lot of people are probably familiar in passing with Richard Trumka, but I was wondering if you could talk about what his legacy is and what losing him means for the labor movement. And then the second part of my question is, why will his successor be so important? And I know that some progressives have been kind of advocating for Sarah Nelson, who is the current president of the Association of Flight Attendants to fill the role. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, um, like I said, why leftists are pushing for her. Yeah, sure. Um, so first, you know, AFL-CIO, what is that? So that is the, it stands for American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations. So the AFL-CIO is the main labor federation in this country. Back in the 1930s, the AFL and CIO were separate. So they merged in 1955 to become the AFL-CIO. And Richard Trumka was head of the AFL-CIO since 2009. And I think his legacy is a little bit mixed and ambiguous. So Trumka rose through the ranks of the labor movement. He came from a family of coal miners in West Western Pennsylvania. He went to work in the mines in the late 1960s. He rose up through his union local and became president of the United Mine Workers of America in 1982. Probably one of the highlights of his career was his leadership during the epic strike at the Pittston Coal Company over health care and retirement benefits, which lasted from April 1989 until February 1990. During this strike, Trump had demonstrated that he wasn't afraid to wage risky militant actions. And his strike was notable for its use of nonviolent civil disobedience tactics that were once common in the labor movement in the 1930s, and of course were widespread during the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. On April 5th, 1989, after working 14 months without a contract and negotiations stalled, the UMWA members employed by Pittston went on strike. The strike affects 1,700 workers in Virginia, West Virginia, and Kentucky. That strike ended in a victory for the mine workers, one of the few big victories for labor during that period. Trumka became president of the AFL-CIO in 2009, and he took over at a time when the labor movement was in deep crisis. And we have to be honest and say that 12 years later, it has only gotten worse. His tenure has been criticized by some of the left within the labor movement for seeming to abandon this kind of militancy that was displayed during the Pittston strike. Uh, funding for new organizing dropped under his leadership, and many felt there was too much emphasis on lobbying Democrats with little to show in return. And I think some of these criti criticisms are valid and we should be taking them seriously. However, we should be careful not to place everything on his shoulders. We should keep in mind that the structural shifts in the U.S. economy that have put labor in this crisis cannot all be blamed on the head of the AFL-CIO. And these issues can't just be solved by a matter of willpower. And though, again, there's a lot we can prob probably criticize on this score as well, Trumka overall did not shy away from bringing up issues of race and gender, even when controversial with his membership. As a minor from Western Pennsylvania, he seems to fit the snobby liberal stereotype of the racist white working class, but his actions told a very different story. For example, in the 1980s, he established a solidarity program with black mine workers in South Africa. He chaired the U.S. Boycott Committee of Royal Dutch Shell, which is one of the major companies that the apartheid regime relied on. 
And remember, this was at a time when our own government under Ronald Reagan labeled the ANC a terrorist group and did not support the anti-apartheid movement. This social justice sentiment, I think, was also on display during the 2008 Obama campaign. Now, I think all our listeners, we can agree that we did not get transformative change under Obama and his labor record was not good. But what's important here is that Trumpka was not afraid to name the issue, that there were many union members who were tempted to reject Obama for the sole reason that he was black. He made effective arguments about how racism divides the working class. Well, there is no evil that's inflicted more pain and more suffering than racism. And it's something that we in the labor movement have a very, very special responsibility to challenge. It's our special responsibility because we know better than anyone else how racism is used to divide working people. We've seen how companies set workers against worker. They throw white workers a few crumbs. They discriminate against black workers or Latino workers, and we all, we all end up losing. But we've seen something else, too. We've seen that when we have the courage, the good sense, the trade union values to cross the color line and stand together, arms locked, no one, no one has ever been able to keep us down. That's why we created the CIO. That's why industrial unions were the first to stand up against lynching and segregation. People need to know that it was the Steel Workers Organizing Committee, this union, that was founded on the principle of organizing all workers without regard to race. That's why the labor movement, imperfect as we are, is the most integrated institution in America. Now, I don't think that we ought to be out there pointing fingers and calling them racist. Instead, we need to educate them. During the last year of his life, he was laser focused on campaigning for the PRO Act, or the Protect the Right to Organize Act, which if passed would be the biggest breakthrough in labor law reform since the New Deal. So again, there are many valid criticisms I think we can make of his leadership, but ultimately it is never a good thing to lose someone who played such a big role in trying to build our labor movement. He was beloved by, not, by many, not just in our labor movement, but around the world. The former and hopefully future president of Brazil, Lula da Silva, sent his regards about Trumpa, Trumpka, saying, Richard, Richard Trumpka marked the history of trade unionism in the United States as the president of the AFL-CIO. Besides fighting for the rights of millions of American workers, he always had international attention and solidarity for the cause, causes of the working class, supporting fair struggles in several countries around the world. I will always owe Trumpka and the AFL-CIO a debt of gratitude for the visit he did to me while I was in, in prison in Brazil and for the attention and solidarity he always had with Brazil and Brazilian workers. Trumpka will be sorely missed in the United States and around the world. To your family, friends, and companions, my condolences. Let's talk about what's, what's next. Um, and as Jen alluded to, there is now a question of what is the future of the AFL-CIO and why it's important. And of course, it's important because the labor movement continues to be in crisis. Um, it continues to decline. I mean, there has been a slight uptick in strike activity. I think there's more public support for unions now than in a long time, but we are in a crisis. So uh, Liz Schuller, who is the current secretary treasurer of the AFL-CIO, will likely finish out Trumpka's term. And she's also the front runner to be elected next year to serve out a full time as president. Of course, for the last few years, there's been a lot of speculation about Sarah Nelson, who is president of the Association of Flight Attendants, running to become the next AFL-CIO head. Nelson has become kind of a labor celebrity, and much of the left wants her to run. And Nelson rose to prominence during the government shutdown, where actions of some flight attendants are thought to have been key in ending the shutdown. And during it, she proposed the idea of a general strike. Since then, she has often advocated for more strikes, for mil more militancy, and general strikes, as I mentioned before. She's not afraid to be close to the left. She speaks at DSA events. You'll see her on networks like Rising, Democracy Now!, and The Real News. She really does seem like a breath of fresh air in the labor movement. And Sarah Nelson is great, and there's nothing wrong with the left being excited about her. But we shouldn't see this race the same way as we would see a Democrat versus Republican or someone like AOC versus a corporate Dem. 
I don't think it would be fair to paint Liz Schiller as an enemy of the left of some kind or a sellout. And for some background about Schiller, she's the daughter of an electrician who was a member of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And she went to work for that union in 1993 as an organizer. One of her earliest big victories was helping to lead a campaign in California in 1998 to defeat an anti-union ballot referendum. In 2018, she played a leading role in mobilizing people in Missouri to reject an anti-union right to work law. But many people feel like Schuller may not be inspiring enough or dynamic enough to lead labor out of the wilderness. And Nelson definitely is not short on the qualities of being inspiring and dynamic. But I think there's actually a bigger question here and we should consider whether we really want someone like Sarah Nelson to be head of the AFL-CIO. I think that you could have the best person at the top, but it may not mean much because ultimately the revival of the labor movement is going to have to come from the bottom up. Maybe we want someone like Nelson to remain at the head of a large and strategic union. So her union, the uh, Association of Flight Attendants, is part of the Communication Workers of America, which in many ways tends to be among the most progressive unions politically in this country. Continuing to build unions like that may be a more important task than winning leadership of the whole AFL-CIO. And Jen, unfortunately, I don't have inside information on whether she's going to run. But I mean, another thing I want to point out is that in the mid-1990s, there was um, a slate called New Voices that took over the AFL-CIO. Uh, very progressive politically. You know, they were talking about organizing new members, uh, being militant, more strikes. And I think it was all genuine, um, mm -hmm. but it didn't really turn the tide as of course we know now. And again, I think it didn't come down to, they didn't have the willpower to do it or didn't want to do it. I think it just kind of points to like this, this crisis is on many levels. Um, you know, we can't get out of it by getting a new AFL CIO head. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, despite their best intention is in the 1990s, it didn't really lead to a big change. Um, so I just kind of say that as a caution that, you know, maybe the left, we shouldn't obsess too much about whether Nelson is in at the top or still in her union, because I don't think it's going to come down to who holds that one position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you were talking about kind of the pros and cons of getting Sarah Nelson in that role, it made me think about a prior Labor Paul episode, uh, actually last week's, I think, when you were talking about shop stewards, and um, we talked a little bit about the qualities that make a good shop steward. Uh, you know, Sarah Nelson, I love Sarah Nelson. Um, she's, you know, as you said, kind of a labor superstar. Uh, she gets the left really excited. She's definitely not afraid of the left or, you know, is it counts herself as a member of the left or, you know, is very open to talking to the left. Um, and that's not nothing. But I think, again, the question is, are those qualities the qualities that we actually want in the president of the AFL-CIO, right? Maybe they are, but, you know, again, just as, just just as just in the same way that a, a good shop steward is not necessarily you know the most popular or dynamic person in the room perhaps the head of you know the largest labor union in the US uh, shouldn't necessarily be you know a kind of like left superstar either i don't know uh, but that's just what that made me think of yeah you know and it's like um, this problem comes up in different forms but like there's always this issue of you know the best talented people, if they all go to the top, you mm -hmm. know, what's left in its wake. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, again, like a union like this, the 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 government shutdown was actually very interesting because mm -hmm. it was a very, very small amount of airline workers that took action that mm -hmm. I think kind of forced it to a head, which really points to, to how strategic that union is in general and, and logistics in general. You know, so I think having someone like Sarah Nelson there kind of dug in would be a good thing. And another mm -hmm. thing about CWA, Again, if you remember when we had Les Leopold on, who talked about his runaway inequality education program, the union that has taken that the farthest has been CWA. Mm -hmm. um, they use it the most. They have the most members engaged on it. Um, so, again, I think it's an open question. Again, I haven't heard a lot lately about whether Sarah will run or not, but I don't mm -hmm. think we should obsess over it as if it's yeah. the most important question for us. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that if there's one takeaway from what you just said, it's that the revival of the labor movement obviously will be from the rank and file, from the bottom up, not from who's the leader, in it, whoever that ends up being. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe. You can also watch the full episode and catch our future live streams by clicking the join button below and becoming a Jacobin YouTube member. Thanks.